The Middle East. It begs the question, middle of what? East of what? The term was coined at the end of the 19th century by, big reveal, the British Foreign Service. The name is entirely Eurocentric. The region is only east of Western Europe, but not east of China or Russia or Africa. This reflects the political realities of the colonial era when the perspective of the British in particular carried enormous weight. So the Middle East region is somewhat arbitrarily defined, especially in a changing world and depending on who is doing the defining, but it does have a long shared history and shared religious traditions. It's the birthplace of the three major monotheistic faiths, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism which is not always a comfortable juxtaposition. The Middle East has a mostly dry, arid landscape, and it contains mostly Arabic-speaking countries, which is why Egypt and other North African countries get lumped in. As defined here, the Middle East stretches from the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf, bounded by the Black and Caspian Seas in the north, and the Sahara Desert and Indian Ocean in the south. These mountains are in Iran, and this beautiful landscape is in Afghanistan. Until the collapse of the Soviet Union, it would not have included the Central Asian states of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. The Middle East has bustling cities like Tel Aviv, a modern city with an ancient past, and all kinds of people, including this Iraqi women's basketball team, giving their traditional culture a new spin. The Middle East is not the same as the Arab world. Middle Easterners are very diverse with many languages and cultures. Several countries in the Middle East are not majority Arabic speaking, including Turkey, Iran, and Israel. Also, there are minority communities within the Arab majority states for whom Arabic is not their native language, including these Kurds. It's also not 100% Islamic. While Islam originated in the heart of what is now Saudi Arabia, it has spread to Muslim communities all over the world. Most Muslims today don't live in the Middle East or speak Arabic. In the Middle East, there are people who practice Sunni and Shiite Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and Greek and Rus Russian Orthodox Christianity. And if you look, you can probably find Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and other believers as well. There are many UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the area, including ancient ruins of some of the world's first major cities. Alas, these international treasures have been in danger of bombing or destruction during recent conflicts. The Middle East has contributed many important innovations in the graphic arts. These include beautiful calligraphy, illustrated manuscripts in many different scripts, a tradition of painted miniatures, the invention of marbled paper, valuable rugs and textile production, elaborate tents and horse tack, incredible mosaic tile work, and fascinating shadow puppets. Placed as it is at the crossroads of cultures between Europe and Asia, the area has been conquered and reconquered by some of the world's greatest rulers and most brutal armies. Whether motivated by religious fervor, the quest for land and riches, or the ambition to rule the world, warriors from Alexander the Great to the Ottoman Ataturks to the European Crusaders to Joseph Stalin and the CIA have soaked these deserts and mountains in blood and left bitter leg legacies of hatred that simmer on today. Ancient writing. At the dawn of civilization, this area gave us the seeds of several modern alphabets. The world's first alphabets, influenced by Egyptian hieroglyphs and proto synatic symbols, developed in Mesopotamia. Around 3000 BCE, the Sumerians, living between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, developed a large settled urban civilization based on agriculture. The people of Sumer created massive stone sculptures and buried their rulers in grand tombs. Writing developed along with settled agricultural societies and the need to keep track of property. It would be nice if people were inspired to invent written languages in order to capture poetry or song, but alas, it probably had more to do with taxes. Poetry is a nice side benefit though. These cuneiform documents were made of clay, embossed using reed tools, and bore official cylinder seals. Papyrus, reed paper, and mineral pigment were scarce, but clay was plentiful. One of these scribes seems to be inscribing a tablet, and another is writing on papyrus or parchment. 
This archaic pictographic script contained the seeds for the development of writing. Information is structured into grid zones by horizontal and vertical division. In this fragment of a tablet, the drilled hole denotes a number, and the pictographs represent animals in a transaction of sheep and goats. This reproduction demonstrates how the Sumerian symbols for star, which also meant heaven or god, for head and for water evolved from early pictographs around 3100 BCE. The latter were turned on their side by 2800 BCE and evolved into early cuneiform symbols by 2500 BCE. This is a receipt showing that three workers were played, paid three bundles of reeds a day for six days. And this document states that the governor Shuma provided 198 sheep and 162 goats the first time, and 41 sheep and 82 female goats the second time. Here we can see that a silver merchant by the name of Ur Dumuzi kept very tidy records, or his scribe did anyway. At last, some poetry. This is a chapter of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here it states how Gilgamesh and his friend go to fell the cedars of Lebanon. And here, written in Old Babylonian at about 1850 BCE, this is the world's oldest remaining cookbook, a collection of recipes for dishes for the royal palace or the temple. This famous work is called the Blau Monument and is early Sumerian. You can see how etched writing and carved relief figures are combined on this early shale artifact. This beautiful stone duck weight dates from 3000 BCE. The cuneiform inscription dedicates the weight to the god Nana and confirms a weight of five minas. A mina is about 18 ounces. This would have been used to standardize weights for exchanges of grain or silver. This stamp cylinder seal combines decorative ornamentation with figurative images. It most likely portrays a ritual, possibly with a sacrificial offering on the right-hand side. It has both an image on the side for rolling and an image on the bottom for stamping. Because it allows multiple images to be made from a single master, the cylinder seal can be seen as a precursor to printing. This important work is a carved stele bearing the Code of Hammurabi. Above the densely textured law code, King Hammurabi is shown on a mountaintop with the seated sun god, who orders the king to write down the laws for the people of Babylon. A graphic image of a divine authority as the source for the code becomes a powerful visual persuasion. Whether pressed into clay or carved into stone as shown here, Mesopotamian scribes achieved great control and delicacy in the arrangement of strokes in a partitioned space. This massive monumental tomb climbing to the heavens demonstrates both the power and the divine origin of the rule of this Sumerian king. Incised into a precious pale blue quartz in a gold mount, this seal probably belonged to a member of the royal family or the high priesthood in Persia. The delicacy of the relief carving produced subtle curves and dimension when stamped into clay. The Cyrus Cylinder is an important work sometimes called the First Declaration of Human Rights, made in Babylon, Mesopotamia sometime after 539 BCE. It records how a victorious king, Cyrus, declared religious freedom for his newly conquered people. He also encouraged Jews to return to Jerusalem and built the Second Temple, which earned him a mention in the Book of Isaiah. Was this cylinder rotated across clay to produce multiple copies of a code of law? The written word acquired unparalleled significance with the arrival of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. Numerous scripts developed to serve a multitude of religious, political, social, and cultural functions. A number of factors such as the prospective audience, the context of the text, and the shape and function of an object informs the type of script employed. The Prophet Muhammad's followers collected his divine revelations from written and oral sources and compiled them into a manuscript known as the Quran. Islam's holiest book. Muslims regard the Quran and Arabic script as the physical manifestation of God's message. So calligraphy is considered the quintessential art form of the Islamic world. 
Arabic letters decorate objects ranging from bowls to buildings. This earthenware bowl bears a calligraphic inscription around the rim that reads, Planning before work protects you from regret. Good luck and well-being. Manuscripts were written on papyrus and parchment, animal skin, before paper was introduced to the Islamic world from China around the 8th century. Because of the status of calligraphy as an art form, the tools associated with it, shears, knives, inkwells, and pen boxes, were often elaborately decorated and sometimes made of precious materials. Calligraphy by well-known masters was often collected by royal patrons and arranged in albums. This page contains a well-known love poem. Textiles with calligraphic bands are called taraz, which means embroidery in Arabic. They were produced in royal workshops and presented to individuals in service to the court. This lampstand is inscribed with a Sufi poem that describes a moth drawn to a flame, linking the surface decoration with the object's function. Today, the languages of Persian, Pashto, Kurdish, and Urdu are among the languages that adopted Arabic letters. Turkish also used Arabic letters until 1928, when the country officially switched to the Latin alphabet. Unique to the calligraphy of the Ottoman Empire was a figure called the Tugra, which was a calligraphic seal that served as the signature of the Ottoman Sultan. In this example, a Tugra of Suleiman the Magnificent, you can see the fabulous merger of writing and decoration. This calligram of a ship at sea exemplifies one of the most innovative artistic genres developed by Ottoman calligraphers. The combination of Quranic verses, prayers, and poetry makes it an object of talismanic devotional power. The continuing centrality of the calligraphic image is beautifully exemplified by the modern Saudi Arabian flag. The diversity of the region is reflected in other handwritten and illustrated books, not only in Arabic and not only containing Islamic teaching. While Europe was in the so-called Dark Ages, math, science, astronomy, and medicine were being studied and recorded in the Middle East. This illustration is from a document recording the uses of medicinal plants in 1229. This guidebook for pilgrims to the Holy Land in the 1400s is a German translation of a book by an Italian friar. On the left is an illustration of the city of Jerusalem, and on the right an image of the pyramids at Giza. This stylized map of Jerusalem was also created for the use of Europeans during the Crusades. The Jewish population of the Middle East region was in exile from 587 BC, and remaining manuscripts are rare and treasured. The Haggadah is a collection of historical stories and proverbs. On this title page of a copy known as the Mainz Haggadah from Mainz, Germany, Copied by Moses ben Nathan Oppenheim in 1726, Moses holds the Ten Commandments on the left, and Aaron, the brother of Moses, stands on the right. This layout implies the melodic rhythm of a buoyant Passover song through spacing and symbol. In Persian, today's Iran, there are many beautifully decorated and illustrated copies of a traditional collection of tales called the Book of Kings, or Shahnameh. produced by the poet and writer Ferdowsi, who began compiling ancient Persian stories and translating them into verse in the year 977 CE. It's a sweeping epic that recounts the myths, legends, and history of Iran from the beginning of time to the Arab conquest of the 7th century. It tells of 50 monarchs, the Shahs, including three women. The Shahnameh essentially encompasses 62 stories in 990 chapters, all in rhyming couplets. Over the centuries, the work has become a blueprint for Persian authors and writers. Today, a modern Iranian, Afghan, or Tajik can still easily read it and understand it. It captures Persian and a greater Iranian identity, but it's also multi-ethnic and diverse with many different ethnic groups represented in it. It's the Persian version of the Iliad or the Odyssey. Another quintessentially Persian art form is miniature painting. The most famous master of Persian painting is known simply as Bizad. He is important both for the paintings he executed and for the wider influence of the style associated with his name. Evidently orphaned at a young age, he was raised and trained in Herat, Afghanistan by a painter and calligrapher. This piece is called The Old Man and the Youth. His intricate style is somewhere between the flat, vertical perspective of Byzantine art and the three-point perspective of the Italian Renaissance. 
His paintings also reveal a careful structure based on the Fibonacci spiral found both in nature and mathematics. Bizad was employed as a court painter for the ruling monarch, illustrating historical manuscripts like this one showing a beheading at court. As the use of paper and making of books became more common, a new art form was born in Turkey. Ebru is the art of marbling, made by floating colored oils on top of water and carefully placing or dragging sheets of paper or parchment to absorb the pigment. Talik, Turkish calligraphy, is overlaid on the finished paper for a total work of art. The batal, or basic rock pattern, is the oldest known pattern in Ebru. Colors are simply applied with a brush to the floating pigments without using a comb or an awl, which require mastery. A marbler's skill is assessed by looking at his batal designs. This page demonstrates the flowing patterns created by dragging a comb through the oils. And this example marries the spontaneous flow of the marbling with precisely placed calligraphy. Some artists manipulate the floating ink with pointed awls or brushes to form realistic images, often flowers. Careful manipulation can result in incredibly realistic images. Across Arabia and Central Asia, there's a long tradition of horse racing, breeding, and the use of mounted cavalry. Royal courts, armies, religious pilgrims, and bands of nomadic herders all traveled long distances by horse and camped along the way in elaborate tents. Kayamiya are elaborately patterned and colorful appliques applied to the interior of tents, serving a dual function of shelter and ornament. They resemble quilts and possess the three layers typical of quilts, a heavy back, a decorative top, and elaborate applique over the top. These festival tents in Cairo featuring interior Kayamiya were depicted by the artist Reginald Barat in 1907. Note that many of the decorative Kayamiya in this artist's shop contain calligraphic designs. Different shaped tents were used by different cultures for different purposes. Elaborate tents sheltered royal wives traveling by camel. Rows of identical tents formed temporary cities for pilgrims to Mecca. And large, beautifully decorated tents held hundreds gathered for weddings, royal audiences, or military commands. The vast empty areas between cities required the stamina of the ship of the desert, a camel. This beautifully built camel topper was for royals on a holy pilgrimage. This early photograph captured the camels and tents of pilgrims on the way to Mecca in 1910. The Kaaba is the central shrine of Allah of the Islamic religion in Mecca. Pilgrims visit it every day of the year, but especially during the holiday of Ramadan. It's covered by a draped cloth, and one day a year the cloth is changed in a ceremony. The sitara, or curtain, for the door of the Kaaba was by far the most elaborate part of the covering and is replaced annually. Since Mamluk times, sitaras were made in e Egypt and left Cairo accompanied by the caravan of pilgrims amidst great pomp and circumstance. A heavily embroidered example like this can weigh over a hundred pounds. After the fasting period of the Ramadan holiday ends, the feasting begins. Royal families and regular families gather in richly decorated tents to eat elaborate meals with many cups of strong coffee and tea. Speaking of fabrics, the Middle East is famous for beautiful geometrically patterned rugs and a rich textile tradition. The Middle East has always been a center of textile production and trade. Trade routes, commonly known as the Silk Road, terminated in the eastern Mediterranean ports, delivering raw materials like silk, wool, cashmere, and dyes from all ends of the earth. Textiles of the Middle East were highly prized goods during the Middle Ages and still are. Many of the words we use to describe textiles in the English language are derived from Persian, Arabic, and Turkish, terms like damask, taffeta, cotton, muslin, seersucker, and mohair. The flowing clothing worn by both sexes throughout the Middle East to protect from sun, wind, and sand provide large canvases for pattern and detail. This back of a robe known as a kaftan is decorated with a peacock feather design. Ilal Abu Khalaf, a textile de dealer in Syria, still has small squares of rich material from Palmyra called art textiles. A mix of silk and gold thread, they are the last of what remains of the fabric he bought from the Matini family, who traded in textiles there for generations. The family disappeared in the recent war, and he has not heard from them in four years. One of the squares in a pattern called arabesque has geometric patterns of blue, gold, and green, a design that Abu Khalaf says reminds him of a thousand and one nights. 
Another few fragments illustrate a scene of Saladin and his sol sh soldiers fighting the Crusaders in the Battle of Jerusalem, the very same battle that brought the Abu Khalaf family to the region over 800 years ago. It's not an exaggeration to say that if this textile dealer looks deeply enough into his co collection, he will find his own past. The tradition of rug making lives on in Afghanistan, along with the tradition of fighting off invaders. This small woven war mat features a stylized Russian Kalashnikov assault rifle, a fragmentation grenade, and a small helicopter. It was made in the 1990s, possibly in a refugee camp. The Hamsa design is a protective symbol that spans cultures. An abstracted hand shape associated with the eye of God and female deities has turned from a traditional object with a spiritual role in both Muslim and Jewish culture into an iconic object used in secular pop culture. This silver, silver decoration from a choker or head ornament is from a Bedouin tribe near Bethlehem in the early 20th century. Made of silk and decorated with metallic embroidery, the dress displays traditional motifs, including the tree of life, birds, and kamsa patterns. The style was characteristic of dowry items of the brides of Baghdad at the time, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian alike. It was worn for the first time by a Jewish bride in the 1880s. Family members later immigrated to London where the dress was worn by her grandson's bride in 1965. This ring dates from the Ottoman Empire in the 1700s. Probably the most famous design tradition of the Middle East is beautiful tile work and mosaics. Zelij is a style of mosaic made from individually hand chiseled tile set into plaster base. The pieces fitted together to form elaborate geometric motifs such as this radiating star pattern. This form of Islamic art is one of the main characteristics of Moroccan and medieval Moorish architecture and spread from the Middle East through southern Europe influencing tile work in Spain, Italy and northwards. Zelij became a standard decorative element along lower walls, in fountains and pools, and for the paving of floors. It's found in both historic and modern buildings throughout the region and the world. This wall covered in Zelij is in Marrakesh. The Rijistan, a world heritage site, was a public square in Samarkand, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, now is in, in Uzbekistan. People gathered here to hear royal proclamations heralded by blasts on enormous copper pipes called dazarchis and to witness public executions. It's framed by three Islamic schools of distinctive architecture from different periods. This detail of a mosaic tiger is from one of the archways above the entrance to the Sher Dor Madrasha school. This glazed, painted, and gilded tile from the 1400s in Afghanistan is remarkable for its striking green color and stylized plant designs. It's similar to a set found near the King's Mosque at Mashhad in eastern Iran. Techniques of pottery and glazing varied across the Middle East, but the ubiquity of clay as a building material and intricate geometric tile work are hallmarks of the region from Cairo to Islamabad. And geometric patterns in repeating tessellation are not only seen in tile work. The Quran forbids the representation of human figures in artwork. This limitation has resulted in a high degree of innovation in the use of calligraphy, geometric, and plant forms across the Arab world. A jali, meaning net, is the term for a perforated stone or latticed screen, usually with an ornamental pattern constructed through the use of calligraphy and pattern. This sandstone carved jali illustrates the complexity of design that can be created with only the line and the circle. It holds three distinct geometric patterns, a star-based pattern in the interior, the interlaced design above the arch, and a simple pierced geometric border. This screen from a mosque in Ahmedabad combines a traditional Indian tree of life motif with a repeated lattice pattern. In hot climates before air conditioning, these screens provided both shade and breeze for interior spaces. This ornamented gold, ivory, and turquoise box from the early 1500s was made by Persian goldsmiths working for the Ottoman court. Ever more complex gold filigree patterns nest inside each area of the inlaid geometry. This mounted warrior sheathing a dagger inside his patterned armor is from a Mughal Indian court. The theme of pattern upon patterns and the combination of both geometric and floral patterns covering tiles, rugs, murals, clothing, and manuscripts all live in harmony on this one intricate illustrated page called Lila and Majnun at School. Now that we've looked at some large overall themes in design, we'll talk about a few influential moments within the epic tale of Middle Eastern history. 
The Byzantine Empire was basically the Eastern Roman Empire during the periods of late antiquity and the Middle Ages. It was centered on the capital of Constantinople. Byzantium was oriented towards Greek culture, characterized by Christianity rather than Roman polytheism, and was predominantly Greek-speaking rather than Latin-speaking. Emperor Heraclius established a new state after reforming the army and administration, changed the official language from Latin to Greek. The Byzantine Empire existed for more than a thousand years from its genesis in the 4th century until its final conquest in 1453. The mixing of cultures across the region is exemplified in this papyrus letter in Latin and Arabic. Recently discovered in the British Library, it's a private letter dating from about 800 AD. It combines two different cultures often considered as opposites and documents survival of Latin in the East long after most writers transitioned to Greek in the 6th and 7th centuries of Byzantium. Based on both the artwork and the type of script, a modified Greek, an origin in Cyprus or Palestine has been suggested for, the volume, for this volume. Lavishly illuminated with a geometric pattern, it contains Christian Gospels. Another example of the Byzantine style is this depiction of the Annunciation, with typically Byzantine gold-leafed background and dome-shaped church towers. This beautiful virgin and child mosaic is in the apse of the Hagia Sophia, church in Istanbul, Turkey. Actually, it is a cathedral. This stunning virgin and child mosaic is in the apse of the Hagia. This stunning virgin and child mosaic is in the apse of the Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Istanbul, Turkey. During this Byzantine period, artists made symbolic depiction prevail over text. We can find it in Byzantine mosaics, church apparels, and icon painting. This very visual culture later gave birth to the Renaissance and the Italian school. As one author states, the icons in your smartphone are also traces of Byzantine culture. This depiction of the archangel Michael is a 10th century golden enamel Byzantine icon from Istanbul, Constantinople. These mosaics are preserved in a mosaic museum in Istanbul. The late antique Byzantium of the 4th to 7th centuries was an open, politically active society where a few different religious movements competed for followers. While Christianity eventually wins out, paganism remains for a long time. This pagan deity is from a Byzantine floor. After the 8th century, Byzantium degenerates and under the influence of various factors becomes a more closed society. The Byzantine Empire became one of the foundations of modern Russian identity and influences Eastern European culture in general. The designers of Golce and Gabbana in the 2014 collection referenced this Byzantine portrait of Empress Theodora, now on display in Ravenna, Italy. Because of its strategic location, the Middle East has been a crossroads of culture and conflict. The Great Silk Road was not one road, but an entire system of caravan routes crossing the Eurasian continent from the Mediterranean Sea to China. The Middle East featured many ports on the Mediterranean where the routes from China, as well as north-south travel around or into the African continent, terminated. In essence, it was the crossroads of the world. As population increased and both water and land travel became easier, movement along these routes influenced trade and cultural ties among all the people and the statehoods located along the way. Trade along the so-called Silk Road ec economic belt included fruits and vegetables, livestock, grain, leather and hides, tools, religious objects, artwork, precious stones and metals, and perhaps most importantly, language, culture, religious beliefs, philosophy, and science. Commodities such as paper and gunpowder, both invented by the Chinese during the Han Dynasty, had obvious and lasting impacts on culture and history in the West. They were also among the most traded items between the East and West. Paper was invented in China during the 3rd century BC, and its use spread via the Silk Road, arriving first in Samarkand in around 700 AD, before moving to Europe through the then Islamic ports of Sicily and Spain. This painted map on parchment from 1375 shows the Silk Road being traveled by Marco Polo. The Levantine Crusades were military campaigns with the avowed purpose of capturing Jerusalem and the Christian holy sites in the Near East that took place between 1095 and 1291. 
Funded by various national and religious authorities, the Crusades attracted ambitious but perhaps poor or untitled European knights and ultimately had the effect of mixing cultures and intermarrying people across the region. The Crusaders established four kingdoms in the Holy Land, one of which was the Kingdom of Jerusalem, ruled from 1131 to 1143. This gorgeous psalter for the emperor was written in Latin, but shows on every illuminated page the influence of Eastern Mediterranean art. The gold backdrop and architectural styles on display are particularly reminiscent of Byzantine illumination. The Ottoman Empire from 1300 to 1918. The Ottoman Empire from 1300 to 1918. The Ottoman Empire was one of the greatest empires in history. Ottoman Turks ruled for more than 600 years and were only defeated on the battlefields of World War I. Osman I, the leader of a nomadic Turkic tribe, began conquering the region in the late 13th century. Control of lucrative trade routes led to vast wealth and an organized military system led to military might. The capital of the empire was centered on Constantinople, which is today's Istanbul in Turkey. The Ottoman kings were keen supporters of scientific discovery and artistic achievement. This celestial globe used by Arabic astronomers includes approximately 60 stars with inlaid silver points. Zodiacal names are engraved along the eclipse. Arabic astronomers and scientists predated similar discoveries in Europe by hundreds of years. Under the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent in the 16th century, the arts flourished, technology and architecture reached new heights, and the empire generally enjoyed peace, religious tolerance, and economic and political stability. There were several artistic periods during the reigns of the sultans. This delicate portrait of Shah Abbas I with a concubine in his garden is done with ink and pigment and gold on paper and dates from 1627. Also, what is she holding in her hand? Oh, a bottle. This miniature painting depicts the epic hero Bahram Gur killing a dragon. Among other trade project products traveling east and west were European artists, artwork, and prints. This painting in particular shows a European influence in the perspective of the background landscape. The Qajar style started shortly after the Zand era during the Qajar dynasty from 1781 to 1925. Qajars were Turkic tribal warlords who defeated the Afghan invaders of Iran and conquered India, rising to power in the late 18th century at the time of the Napoleonic Wars. A diplomatic struggle at the Persian court involved a number of European countries, which once again opened the gates to the cultural influences of Europe. Qajar dynasty art reflects this influence. The many portraits of the Shah of Qajar at various points of his life depict him in a wide array of circumstances. From armor-clad warrior king to flower-smelling gentleman, the portraits were commissioned to project images of his wealth, power, and sophistication. While he never visited, many portraits of him were sent to European monarchs in the effort to convey the majesty of his court. In reality, he was caught in a power squeeze between Romanov, Russia, and the British Raj of India. The straightforward gaze of the Shah in this portrait lends him a very modern aspect. Portraying Persian women in fashionable European attire was another significant innovation. Abu Hassan Khan Ghaffari Kashani, who lived from 1814 to 1866, is known as Sani ol Mulk, Persian for craftsman of the realm. He was an Iranian painter, miniature, and lacquer artist and book illustrator. In 1829, he became a pupil of the best of the Ottoman Shah's court painters. This 1842 portrait of the king, Muhammad Shah Qajar, secured him a position at the court. In my opinion only, do you think he may possibly have exaggerated the good looks of the king to get an inn at court? Kashani was sent to train in Italy at the age of 28, studying the works of Italian masters. After four years, he returned to Persia, was appointed chief painter of the court. Notice the shift in perspective in this painting where he seems to show off his Italian training and the inclusion of a European style table and chair. Also note the books covered with marbled paper. He also became involved with the first newly established modern institution of higher learning in Iran. 
In 1853, the master supervised a team of 34 paintings in creating 1,134 pages of miniature illustrations for a priceless Persian edition of A Thousand and One Nights. In his last years, he assumed more administrative responsibilities, including editing government periodicals and supervising new Iranian printing establishments. At its height, the Ottoman Empire was a real player in European politics and was home to more Christians and Muslims. This brings us to the colonial era and a phenomenon known as Orientalism. Orientalism is a term in art history and cultural theory coined by Edward Said in the 1900s as he studied the depiction of the Near East by Western artists in the 19th century. Said considers Napoleon's conquest of Egypt in 1798 as the beginning of modern Orientalism. He points out that Napoleon did not go to Egypt with soldiers only. He also took linguists, historians, anthropologists, sociologists, scientists, and artists with him. A type of propaganda, this painting was commissioned by Napoleon himself, who wanted the artist to depict a scene when Napoleon went to Jaffa to visit French soldiers who were sick with the plague putting to rest the rumors that he wanted to execute the soldiers. It even shows him touching one man's sore. Napoleon's conquest began an era of fascination with all things ancient and oriental. Images of the daily life, history, and topography of Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, the Arabian Peninsula, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and sometimes modern Greece, the Crimea, Albania, and the Sudan constitute its subjects. This fascination with a romantic idea of the Holy Lands is reflected in visual art and epic poems such as Sailing to Byzantium and Byzantium. In Orientalist works, Easterners are presented as the different, the strange, the other. In turns, romantic poems like Byzantium present the Near East as a perfect land of eternal youth that lives in harmony with the universe, or, alternately, a kingdom of sin, gore, and greed. These images creep into persistent racist, racist tropes of sexualized harem girls and boys and bloodthirsty Muslims, even in today's age. This painting of the bath is a typically voyeuristic, sensualized view of a white-skinned woman being bathed by her African attendant. The bath in which they're located is adorned with turquoise tiles, Arabic calligraphy, and a pair of platform sold shower shoes, perhaps from China. Orientalism also influenced European craft, furniture, and architectural design, as well as fashion. In the scramble by colonial powers for strategic Middle Eastern ports and cities, a number of nations and states were absorbed as part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Hundreds of propaganda placards targeted the Muslim lands with exhortations on public health, industrialization, and class consciousness. This poster celebrates two years of the Bolshevik Revolution. It was made in Kazan in 1919. This poster from Uzbekistan in 1933 reads Strengthen Working Discipline in Collective Farms. The 1920s saw an unfettered flowering of creativity in these regions, especially among Russian-trained artists based in Tashkent and Baku, while central publishing houses in Moscow and Leningrad were shifting to socialist realism, artists in the periphery continued the avant-garde movement, combining it with local traditions. These colorful posters from the 1920s and early 1930s, with their longer texts and multiple figurines, could be seen as direct descendants of local calligraphy and miniature traditions. There are several posters that show the Soviet Red Star and the Muslim Crescent together. This poster from Adsari in the 1920s reads, Life in the East was slow. This poster reassures horse-loving Arabs that new machinery cannot do away with the horse, made in the 1920s. This poster reads, Female Muslims, the Tsar, the Bey, and the Khans took your rights away. One of the most striking features of the posters overall is the variety of alphabets. Aziri, Kyrgyz, Tatar, and Uzbek, among others, appear in Arabic script in the 1920s and then Latin in the 1930s. Before the coming of the Soviets, few outside the region's urban intelligentsia and clergy were literate. They wrote their languages using Arabic script. But by the time the Bolsheviks had consolidated power in the late 1920s, Moscow began a literacy drive using modified Latin scripts.
With the end of the Ottoman Empire in World War I, the Middle Eastern nation states exchanged rule by kings, sultans, and beys to conflict and struggle with colonialist powers while moving towards independence. In Turkey, the development of graphic design began with the social and economic activities that followed the declaration of a republic in 1918. The new nation found its visual style with a modern master. Ehab Halosi Gori documented the developments of Turkish industry, development, and society over his lifetime with hundreds of works. Born in Egypt, Gori studied in Germany but came back to Istanbul in 1925 and participated in the liberalization of his new country. Trained in the workshop of Ludwig Holwein during his education in Germany, one can spot the influence of Holwein's style as well as the point where Gori moves beyond it. This poster has a clear relationship to Holwein's advertising posters, including the distinctive hand lettering. Like Holwein, Ehop includes his personal signature, his name above an inverted triangle. Gori was the master of the process of color lithography. This alphabet book, using the Latin alphabet as opposed to Arabic script, was commissioned by Ataturk, the first modern ruler of Turkey. Against a distinctively Turkish landscape, it is charmingly unclear who's teaching whom to read with the new alphabet. See again the proud signature of the artist. This poster invites Turkish travelers to visit Egypt, a masterpiece of composition, color, and harmony. This alphabet book, using the Latin alphabet as opposed to Arabic script, was commissioned by Ataturk, the first modern ruler of Turkey. Against a distinctively Turkish landscape, it is charmingly unclear who's teaching whom to read with the new alphabet. See again the proud signature of the artist. This poster invites Turkish travelers to visit Egypt, a masterpiece of composition, color, and harmony between type and image. Another modernist trained in Germany, Emin Baron, is famous for his calligraphic compositions, mixing Arabic and Latin characters. His work contributed to maintain the legacy of Kufic characters as a Turkish influence. He developed a series of coins, posters, banknotes, and packaging for daily products, and devoted 45 years of his life to illustrate and advertise the Turkish state lottery tickets. The 1970s saw the rise of advertisement and marketing, transforming graphic design into a recognized occupation in Turkey. Bülent Erkmen and Sadiq Kara Mustafa helped to understand and develop this new activity. They also became communication consultants for public institutions such as museums, theaters, and city councils. In the same cultural domain, Savas Sekik is, almost, is also famous for the role he played in Turkish cultural design as a consultant for the national theaters. Note the clever typographic design that reads Paris on one side and Istanbul on the other, making a parallel between these two world cultural centers. This Arabic postcard by artist Burhan Katufli from 1981 demonstrates the return to Arabic script along with a more realistic, less abstracted style. The connection with the pre-colonial past is represented by a woman in traditional dress, the use of classic pattern motifs, and the Arabic script, although the patriot in this poster is carrying a rifle rather than a baby or a bundle of rugs. Like the previous work, this postcard produced in Turkey is in support of Palestinian liberation. The shape in the center of the sunflower is an abstracted shape of Palestine. And this poster from 2014 associates a free Palestine with the power of the pen and the kafia, the traditional Arabic checked headcloth. Let's look at design in modern Iran. The art of calligraphy is still considered to be the most accomplished of the applied arts of Islam and is widely used in Iranian graphic design. Calligraphy remains a major element, even supplanting the visual, whereas it's mostly the opposite in Western culture. Words and images intermingle to become one, and letters become illustrations. One cannot grasp the meaning of Iranian graphic design without considering the importance of the calligraphic symbol and the master of these works, Riza Abedini. Abedini is one of only two designers from the Middle East represented in the Meg's textbook. Morteza Mamiez is another leading designer from Iran and a master of the movie poster. While Abedini is the master of the calligraphic form as illustration, Mamayas has a more pictorial approach. Working in the time period of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, his work belongs to the overall 
category of conceptual posters. Visual double entendre, such as this poster where an inkwell becomes a lighter, relate Momias' work to Western designers like Milton Glaser and Armando Testa. Now let's jump to designers of modern Israel. This 1920 poster is an appeal for donations to the Jewish National Fund to help establish the State of Israel. The Project of Israel was supported by both the United States and Britain at the end of the First World War, with shifting boundaries in the region. The designers Gabriel and Maxim Sheftlowitz, later Shamir, were born in Latvia, Russia. Both studied graphics and design in Berlin in the late 1920s. They're most famous for their design of the National Seal of Israel, shown here. The brothers moved to Palestine, later Israel, and set up a studio in 1934. This poster, called The Worker, shows the influence of Russian constructivism in 1937. While this It's Your Turn recruiting poster for the Israeli Auxiliary Territorial Service in 1942 seems much more a reflection of American-British World War propaganda posters. This stamp by the Shafir brothers from the 1960s commemorates Operation Ezra and Nehemiah, the effort to bring Iraqi Jews to Israel. And this modernist stamp by designer Abram Games in 1953 reads, Conquer the Desert. Here, the Israeli Postal Authority positions Palestine as an un uninhabited desert territory. This 1956 poster by the Israeli designer Jean David was for the Israel Department of Tourism to promote the nation as a holiday destination. Probably the most famous designer from Israel, and the second designer recognized with a seat at the Meg's table, is David Tartikover of Israel. This poster of a Zionist theorist of the 19th century layers a map of the West Bank over Herzl's face, calling it Stain. It lets viewers come to their own conclusion about what and who is the Stain. One of Tartikover's most lasting works is this symmetrical typographic piece that states, Now, Peace, Now. It's as famous in the region as the I Heart New York image is in the United States. This is another anti-war poster by Tartikover. I think of him as the Israeli Milton Glaser. Same period, same colorful, unhuman, humor-infused style. Although Tartikover is Israeli, he clearly sympathizes with the Palestinian point of view. The Palestinian Liberation Movement is supported by different groups and nations within the Arab world. They all oppose the Israeli occupation of the West Bank that began in 1967 and continues today. Among the groups are the PFLP, Fatah, Hamas, and the PLO. This image is by the designer Ismail Shamut in 1965. An appeal from the PLO that shows the shape of Palestine in the center and the flags of the Arab nations that support it. This poster for the PFLP was designed by Ghazan Kanafi in 1968 and shows another woman warrior. This poster reads, O oh, Warriors. It's a two-part vertical poster from 1978 printed in Lebanon. This 1968 poster for Fatah replaces traditional pattern with repeated images of a chain-link fence and the traditional head wrap called a kafia. This appeal by the government of Algeria is much more graphic. It's on a stamp by the artist Ali Karbouche in 2001. Palestinian Affairs is a quarterly magazine issued by the PLO's Palestinian Research Center. The magazine published articles in Arabic related to Palestinian politics, culture, economics, and international relations and other subjects. From 1971 to 1983, it was published in Beirut, but moved to Cyprus after a car bomb attack which killed eight staff members. The General Union of Palestinian Plastic Artists consulted on the selections of the cover art from the 1980s onward. Wherever you stand on the Israeli-Palestine conflict, you must admit these covers and the posters from both sides are striking. This 1979 poster calls on Iranian citizens to boycott American products. And this graphic play on the U.S. flag is a 1979 poster for the Islamic Republican Party in Iran. Angels and Bayonets was designed in 2002 for the second visual art experimental festival in Iran. This clever visual symbol was designed by Tahamtan Aminian in 2004 in Iran. This poster reads, Because she was with Palestine, 
It's by the firm Research in Progress in 1976. Mary Rose Bolos was a Christian Lebanese woman from Beirut. Because of her sympathies for the Palestinian refugees, she was executed by a Christian militia during the conflict. Not to jump too abruptly to the present, but I found two female artists from the Middle East operating in an area between graphic design, illustration, and fine art. The first is Muna Baseli Senu, working in Lebanon. Senu was born in Alexandria, Egypt. Her style is influenced by a Middle Eastern cultural heritage as reflected in the flat treatment of colors in both Byzantine icons and Persian min miniatures. The treatment of space is very personal and brings a new dimension to a figurative approach by the use of hieroglyphic-like symbols and windows that open to reveal an added aspect of the subject treated. Another contemporary female artist is Saule Sulemenova. She was born in the 1970s into an intellectual family behind the Iron Curtain in Kazakhstan. In troubled December of 1986, she secretly ran away from home to join the student riots and became part of a student artist activist group. The members of Green Triangle performed on the streets and exhibited their works to the public. They also went to the Almonte Mountains for days to reflect, practice shamanism, and enjoy the purity of the water, skies, and sun. Sal reflects that the group's main motto was just three words, freedom, art, sun. She states that in her work, she's searching for an authentic Kazakh identity. She uses archival images of pre-Soviet era Kazakhs, like this picture of a grandmother on a cow. As another attempt to find a new way for her country by using the past, she melts together recycled plastic bags to create these large-scale tapestries. Like the rug makers of Samarkand, the designers of the Middle East continue to produce work that travels across the world and blends East and West, new and old, modernity and tradition, to create beautiful patterns that touch the soul.